Okay, so in this video we're going to continue, we're going to talk about x-ray production, we're going to look at some simple x-ray tubes in Linux, and we're mostly going to try to focus on the x-ray production and not the functioning of these different systems. Um, so here's a diagram, very simple x-ray tube that I diagrammed out here, and we're going to run through the different parts of it and how this works. So all x-ray tubes um, function in a vacuum, so we have this kind of vacuum housing around the x-ray tube, they suck all of the air out of this so that when the electrons are traveling from the cathode to the anode, they can do so without uh, running into any air molecules or losing um, any energy while they do that. Um, and so the way most things produce uh, an electron beam is they use a hot cathode. So in the x-ray tube, you'll see this thing. It's usually um, a spiral of tungsten. It looks almost like an incandescent bulb, like an <clears throat> old light bulb, a spiral of incandescent or a spiral of tungsten which then we send a um, current through. So we put a voltage on it, we put some current through the tungsten, it glows white hot like a light bulb, and then it's all set to make electrons go from one side to the other. But the electrons just won't go there on their own, you have to help them out. And that's what the voltage is for. So this current source is isolated here, and then we have this voltage that goes from the cathode to the anode. We have a voltage supply. You can change the voltage, you can tune the voltage to whatever you want. This voltage supply gets translated to create a voltage gap between the cathode and the anode. And so this will start the electrons, which are boiling hot on the tungsten wire of the cathode, to jump across the voltage gap and collide into the anode. And as they go from cathode to anode, they're accelerated by the voltage. They hit this anode. They either produce heat or they make x-rays. And that's how we get an x-ray beam out of it. Um, another quantity that's measured during this is the tube current. So as this electricity flows from cathode to anode, you're going to have an electrical loop this way, and we have a, a tube current. So the tube current is defined as the current of electricity running from the cathode to the anode in the x-ray tube. So we have two, two different currents, the filament current and the tube current in there. And that's, that's the basics of an x-ray tube. Um, just some terminology that you should memorize. The cathode is negatively charged electrode. It's the filament, mostly made out of tungsten. It has current going through it to make it very hot. We also have the anode, positively charged electrode. This is where the electrons stop and creates the x-ray source. The tube voltage, that's the voltage between the cathode and the anode. It's the accelerating voltage of the electrons to make x-rays. And for x-ray tubes, that's the part that we can tune, right? We can take our selector and we can pick exactly which tube voltage we want to use. Tube current, this is the electric, electrical current between the cathode and the anode. It determines how many x-rays are made. More tube current means more x-rays produced. It also means more heat on the anode, um, and that's the tube current. Um, these days it's usually done by pulsing, so the current is pulsed through it. Um, and also the filament current, so this is the current through the filament to heat it up and cause the electrons to move from the cathode to the anode after the voltage is applied. They, they won't move just on their own. And you may see these on the Linux these days. You may get an M-fill or a K-fill fault on the Linux. The fill part of that is filament. So the, um, the klystron has a filament in it to create electrons, and the magnetron has a filament in it. So when you see M-fill and K-fill faults, you should be thinking that some current should be running through a filament to make a filament hot to make electrons come out of it, and it's not doing that, so my LINAC is faulting out. Um, the X-rays are produced using Bremsstrahlung. So Bremsstrahlung is when a high-energy electron or a whole bunch of electrons collide into usually a metal target and produce heat or X-rays. Um, and in this diagram, I have the LINAC on this side, uh, a tiny little, here's a tiny pulse of electrons is going down through the LINAC. The voltage is essentially the whole tube of the LINAC. Comes down here, bends through 270 degrees, and hits maybe like a copper target or something like that, where the electron beam stops and produces x-rays going forward. Um, contrast that with an x-ray tube, um, which is what's used these days for CT scanning and KV imaging on our LINAX. Here we have a tungsten filament Right here with its current source, there's a voltage across the x-ray tube. The electrons jump from 
cathode to anode collide and x-rays come out of it. So in the LINAC, the x-rays um, are produced when this electron beam hits this target and transmit through it, whereas in the tube, the electrons jump this voltage gap and produce x-rays coming this way. Um, what this target is made out of is important, right? We can't make it out of just anything. You can imagine we need something that is higher in atomic number, something maybe like tungsten or copper or some other type of metal. And we also need something that can get hot without melting. So a lot of times these targets are made out of tungsten, which has a high melting temperature, or um, copper or something like that, um, which goes towards the production efficiency. So we have kind of this simple equation down here, and we have an x-ray production question um, in the homework. So generally, like the um, energy that goes into making x-rays divided by the energy that goes into heat. So we're doing a ratio of x-ray production versus heat production is proportional to the energy of the accelerated electrons um, crashing into the anode multiplied by the atomic number of the target um, that the anode or the x-ray target is made out of. So um, if we use higher Z materials, like for example, tungsten has a Z of um, 74, we'll get um, better x-ray production. If we use higher energy electrons and we ramp up the accelerating potential, the accelerating voltage of those electrons a great deal, we'll get more x-rays produced instead of heat. And you can see it in this um, table here. The simple table is um, the operating voltage of the accelerators. So we have x-ray tubes are here, maybe like 60, 100, or 200 kilovolt accelerating potential in the x-ray tube compared to maybe 4 MeV electron beam or 20 MeV electron beam in a LINAC, you can see that as we get towards higher energies and um, we get more x-rays produced compared to the number of x uh, amount of heat made. Um, sometimes this is why some departments like to warm up their LINAC using the highest x-ray energy because it heats the tube up more slowly. Um, other departments may run differently. Sometimes I think we'd like to run the electron beam because it helps get all the other parts of the LINAC warmed up. Um, and then over here I have a graph, and this is a graph of x-ray production. And I have in orange is the x-rays that actually make it out of the x-ray tube versus the number that are actually produced. So the tube voltage, this is important, it determines the maximum x-ray energy that can be made um, in the x-ray tube. Uh, and then you'll see that this area here, this triangular area, shows you the amount of x-rays that are produced inside the anode as a function of the largest accelerating potential, the 100, in this case, 100 um, keV um, accelerating potential, 100, 100 k kilovolts on this x-ray tube. And it makes this many x-rays in this triangular area. Um, those x-rays don't all make it out of the anode. And you're going to be um, calculating and plotting this in the homework. You can see here's the attenuation of x-rays for tungsten. So um, tungsten C is equal to 74. And you can see at low x-ray energies, it's really highly attenuating. So there's a lot of attenuation of all these um, low energy x-rays and much less attenuation at the higher x-ray energies. So what's happening inside the x-ray tube is that x-rays are produced within the first, you know, maybe millimeter or so of the tungsten anode. Most of those x-rays don't make it out because even trying to get maybe a tenth of a millimeter out of the anode, a lot of these x-rays are going to be attenuated away. And instead, you get this orange um, x-ray beam out of it that's made up of a whole bunch of different x-ray energies. Um, another aspect of these x-ray beams, which are pretty important, is that it tends to be forward peaked in its x-ray distribution. So in this example, we have um, a 20 MeV electron beam making a 20 MV x-ray beam, like for radiotherapy. It's going to make x-rays from 20 MeV x-rays all the way down to zero. Most of those ones down at zero are attenuated away. But then you can see this is like an intensity distribution. You can see in this um, kind of like um, angular intensity distribution, um, the 20 MeV x-rays mostly tend to go straight ahead, so in the same direction of the electron beam. 
And then as we go down to four MEV X-rays, we get kind of a more wider distribution, 400 um, KV X-rays out of there, and at 100, it's much more evenly distributed. So this is um, basically how we get our unflattened beam in the LINAC. As the electron beam comes in and hits that target, the high energy X-rays are the, gonna be the ones mostly going forward. The low energy ones are gonna spread out a little more evenly and we end up with an unflat beam, and we also end up with a beam that on the, in the middle part of the X-ray beam, we get more high energy X-rays produced compared to um, uh, you know, other parts of the X-ray beam as it goes around. Um, it also helps explain like the X-ray techniques. So the X-ray techniques are the specific um, tube voltage that you put on an X-ray tube for imaging. Um, as well as like um, the milliamp seconds or the tube current um, that's going through it. So in this graph, we have an example where we're increasing the tube voltage. So keeping all else equal, we're turning up the voltage on the x-ray tube. You know, we're going from 80 to 90 to 100 to 110 kilovolts between the cathode and the anode. And the x-rays that are produced in it um, is, you know, in this triangular area. So when we turn up the tube voltage, keeping everything else equal, we get more x-rays as we go to higher um, tube voltages. Contrast that with the other situation where instead of, we're gonna keep voltage fixed this time, we're gonna turn up the tube current, right? So the maximum, in this example, the tube voltage is set to 110 kilovolts. The maximum x-ray energy we can get out of that is 110. And then the x-ray production is gonna be in this, and as we go down through different amounts of um, tube current, we're going to be getting uh, more or less x-rays out of it. Um, so here's some different examples of x-ray tubes. I'm going to try to, we do have an example of one of these x-ray tubes. I'm going to try to find it and make a video out of it. Um, these days, uh, some x-ray tubes are evacuated glass enclosures, so you'll have this pretty nice looking glass enclosure where they suck all the gas out of it. Um, prevents the electrons from interacting with the gas molecules uh, right before reaching the target. The other reason to suck all the air out of the um, x-ray tube is that this tungsten filament right here, it will oxidize. Like if it's around oxygen molecules and you heat it up, it will oxidize in an, in an instant and, and blow up, which I can show you an example of. Um, another thing that the tube housing does, you can see like in this one, this one's made out of metal. Um, it prevents leakage of the radiation. So in this, in this example right here, you can see this is the exit port for these x-rays. We want this tube going toward, we want the x-rays going towards the patient. We want all our other x-rays shielded. So sometimes you'll see x-ray tubes like this that have like a large metal enclosure to help attenuate um, the x-rays that might leak out of this and um, send radiation towards, you know, um, somebody doing a dental x-ray or something like that. Some of these do use oil cooling. So they have like an oil bath that helps dissipate the heat um, for the cathode. And a lot of them have like a thin glass window which allows the x-rays to pass through. So this one produces x-rays right here. They go through the glass and get out. This one has a window down here. So as the x-rays jump from here to here, they'll shine out this way. And for this one has a, a port down there. These x-ray tubes in Linux produce what we call a polychromatic spectrum. Polychromatic meaning that there are many different energy x-rays coming out of a single Linux and a single x-ray tube. Um, and so <clears throat> in this um, example that I'm recycling here, you can see the x-rays are produced here. You get a whole wide range of x-ray energies out of it. And then um, coming out of the x-ray tube, you get something like this. There are some characteristic x-rays for um, if this is a tungsten target coming out of it. But out of the x-ray tube, you get a whole bunch of different x-rays. This is kind of like the sun, right? So here's the, the spectra, spectrum of solar radiation hitting on Earth. This is the visible light spectrum. And I think I, I'm showing this because I think we're just more aware that the sun produces red, yellow, green, blue, violet light. We have this multicolored spectrum 
of light coming out of the sun, it's really not too different that our x-ray tube kind of has this multicolored x-ray spectrum coming out of it. We end up with a polychromatic x-ray beam instead of just a monoenergetic x-ray beam. Um, but just to cite some examples, here are some examples of monoenergetic beams. So this is monoenergetic electron beam. So if we have, um, you know, our Linux have 6, 9, 12, and 16 MV x-rays, and these like thin little um, Gaussians right here, these thin little blips show the spectrum of electrons coming out. So the, for 6, 9, 12, and 16 MEV X-ray beams, almost all the electrons are narrowly bunched right around that energy. Um, it's also the same thing for cobalt-60, right? So cobalt-60 has gamma rays coming out of it. Remember, gamma rays are X-rays that are coming from nuclei, and it's pretty dominated by these two main peaks in the cobalt-60 spectrum. There may be some other low-energy X-rays produced um, in the whole process, um, but it's really just these main two peaks right up here around, you know, 100, and, or I should say um, 1.2 um, MeV X-rays coming out of the cobalt-60 beam. So these are examples of monoenergetic X-rays. <clears throat> so all this is great, and we use all of these characteristics to describe our X-ray beams, so our photon beams that we use for treating patients. Um, one of the most important things about the X-ray beam is the accelerating potential. Um, that would be the 6 MeV accelerating potential or the 16 MeV accelerating potential. Those will produce very different X-ray beams, so it's critical to know which energy we're treating with and what accelerating potential. It also goes towards the beam quality. Um, beam quality basically is kind of a jargon term that's used to tell us um, how high or low energy um, the X-rays are in the spectrum for the different MV X-ray beams. Um, we also have flatness and symmetry. It's another characteristic that we used um, and the beam penumbra. So I'm going to jump through all of those. So you remember in the beam characteristics we have um, a situation where we have um, a conversion of absorbed dose to kerma. Here's the absorbed dose line going through it. Um, and we have a buildup region. So every single MV X-ray beam has a buildup region and it builds the um, beam up to D-max. Every single X-ray energy has its own D-max. And in general, as we scale towards higher X-ray energies, the D-max of the beam gets deeper and deeper um, inside the patient. Um, we also have these important things like, this is like the penumbra of the beam. So here's a profile. If we had a, a scanning tank with a chamber, and we scanned it across this beam, uh, measuring the intensity of x-rays as we go from outside the beam to inside the beam, through the beam, and then back out again. You get a profile like this, so the dose is low. The dose ramps up as we go from outside the jaw into the middle of the x-ray beam. It's kind of flat in the middle, and then it rolls back off again as it comes back out. Um, what we do with these profiles is we normalize them to 100%. So we'll go to some preferred depth, maybe like D max, maybe 10 cm deep inside our um, patient. Quite normally, most often it's D max, so we'll just pretend this one's at D max. And we um, tell the software that we're using, like, hey, uh, I want this to be 100% of the dose, and it'll normalize this back out and rescale our graph to be 100%. And then, um, then we calculate these important quantities. So if this beam is 100% right in the middle. We want to find out where it's 80%. As we go from inside the beam to outside, we want to know where that 80% position is. And then we'll come down as we cross through the shadow of the x-ray beam and come out to the jaw. And we want to know where it's also 20%, right? So when we pick these two quantities off, the position of this 80% line as we come from central axis towards the edge of the beam, and also where this 20% um, isodose line is, as we come from the middle out to 20% of the beam, we get these two positions off, and then we have something called the 80-20 width. And what the 80-20 width does is it tells us how quickly this x-ray beam is able to ramp from 20% up to 80% dose, and then back down again. Um, this is important for applications like <clears throat> 
uh, VMAT or maybe radio surgery where if we're treating close to a critical organ, we want that beam to ramp down, go from 80% to 20% as quickly as it possibly can because that normal structure is usually underneath our jaw, the thing that we're caring about, our MS layer or our jaw. So we want to make sure our beam rolls off quickly. Um, another characteristic of the beam that's important is the field size. Um, so the field size is the width of 50% of the maximum dose. So if I know right on central axis, I'm going to call that 100%. I find out how wide the beam is, where you're getting um, half the dose as you go from inside the beam to outside the beam. And that width is the beam width, um, the field size of the beam. That's the definition of it. I know you're probably thinking like you could shine the light field onto the patient and that light field shows you what the jaw size is. Um, but I think the reality is the makers of the LINAC make it so that the beam rolls off in such a way that the 50%, the width of the 50% isodose lines ends up matching what the light field is anyway. So they kind of made it work that way. Um, this is an example of different percent depth doses as we increase the energy of the x-ray beam. So um, here in the orange, we have an orthovoltage beam using three millimeters of copper filtration. The D max of this beam is right at the surface. Norm I normalized all of these to 100. So it's D max is right at the surface, zero depth, and it drops off quickly. Um, ortho machines are things you might use to like treat skin lesions or something like this. Some clinics down in Florida treat a lot of skin lesions and they'll um, use an ortho set machine to do that. It's pretty good. Um, Cobalt 60 beam is here in green. You can see the D-max of this one, I believe, is around um, 10 millimeters deep. Then we move to 10 MV. The D-max gets deeper, and 25 MV um, it gets deeper and deeper. So, um, you know, the effect of this is that as we get to higher energies, the <clears throat> dose right at the skin surface is going from like 100% down to 50%, down to maybe 20% or 15%. So the zero depth dose is going down. And then the maximum dose is getting deeper in the patient. And this essentially causes our skin sparing effect. So um, it used to be, they used to use cobalt 60 to treat something like head and neck cancer, right? But the D-max was right inside most of the skin surface. And some of these patients would get very red. They treat them with like parallel opposed cobalt 60 beams and the patient's skin would turn bright red and they had a very difficult time um, getting through that treatment. Um, as we move to higher energies like maybe a 10 MV it moves that maximum dose deeper inside the patient and using modern techniques we're able to reduce the skin dose quite a bit. So it's both using modern techniques and using higher energy x-rays. Um, so this is a slide I'm not going to quiz you on all the equations on this side. This is like a physics slide. Um, but we do a lot of quantification and measurement of dose in radiotherapy. Um, and the main way we do this is using like a well calibrated ionization chamber. The ionization chamber measures exposure, which has units of charge per unit mass. Um, and then we have to know the um, type of x-ray beam we're using, the quality of the x-ray beam how the x-rays interact. Here's a part of the equation that does um, the electron excitation and ionization and things like that. So we have to take all of these different quantities together. Um, we swirl it all together and then we get exposure. So X is the exposure and it basically tells us how many ion pairs are being produced inside our air chamber, um, inside the system. And then we can use that to calculate the dose to air. And then using dose to air, we can calculate the dose to water. So being very careful and using a well-calibrated chamber, um, knowing what all of these quantities are, measuring our x-ray beams to know exactly what energy they are, and plugging in all the appropriate inputs, we're able to calculate dose to water um, pretty accurately. We can get about half percent easily on the dose to water. Um, and this is how we do our, our basic beam calibration and setup and things like that. Um, here's some dose units that you need to memorize. You should look at this slide and try to memorize and read up on all of these different units. Um, the first one I talked about previously is exposure. This is uh, measured in Röntgen. 
Um, one Ronkin is the same as 2.58 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram. And this is basically the, the thing we measure with our ion chambers all the time. When you have an ion chamber and you're measuring um, a reading on it, you'll be measuring Ronkin, which is basically how much charge is collected. Um, we also have dose, which is measured in units of gray. One gray is equal to uh, one joule per kilogram. Don't forget that um, we also have like 100 centigrade is equal to one gray using the um, SI units. And you may have heard a rad, like not many people talk about rads anymore, but one rad is equal to one centigrade. Um, another unit you need to know about is dose equivalent. You may have heard about this in radiobiology class. Dose equivalent, we usually call it H, and it's measured where H is equal to the physical dose, this dose right here, multiplied by a quality factor, Q. So Q is kind of a number that um, essentially derived using physics and radiobiology. Um, Q is one for x-rays and electrons um, because I would say because that's the dominant treatment modality that most people use and x-rays are producing electrons and electrons are doing dose <coughs> and electron beams are doing dose directly um, we can settle on that and say that's um, one quality unit for um, figuring out dose equivalent. But other particles, because they have different, um, they have different um, ionization per unit distance, they will have um, produce more dose inside the patient. So you may have a quality factor of five for slow moving neutrons or protons. Uh, maybe up to 20 for fast new moving protons and alpha particles and things like that. And so um, just knowing how much dose a certain particle deposited, how much um, it's done, isn't enough because not all radiation is the same. And so, for example, like radon gas in your home gives off alpha particles. Um, there's not a lot of radon in your home, but for one gray of radiation from an alpha particle, you could be getting 20 times that dose equivalent, which has the biological effect um, on your patient. Uh, we also have the concept of the REN, REM, which is Runkin Equivalent Man. This is a, a dose, a radiation safety dose um, equivalency that attempts to, um, you know, kind of boil down the radiation dose into uh, what um, might be typical for the public. And it has SI units of sieverts. So dose equivalent um, has the SI units called the sievert. It's the exact same units as dose. So dose is joules per kilogram. Dose equivalent, or the sievert, is joules per kilogram, which means that the quality factor is unitless. Right? So we have this unitless quantity here. It doesn't have units of dose or anything. We multiply it. Quality factor times dose to get dose equivalent, which has SI units of sievert which is important for um, radiation safety and things like that.